You know what drives me nuts? RF. Yeah, some parts of my design are supposed to be antennas and pumping out lots of power, and other parts, not so much. <laughs> Keeping all that EMI under control, particularly in space-constrained devices, is tricky. And I really don't want to have to go redesigning my PCB because maybe, uh, hypothetically, I messed up a return path and accidentally made an antenna, which has now shut down all of the cell towers within the... Uh... Oh, it's not that bad? Okay, phew. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. One of the best ways to soak up stray EMI is with a cool noise suppression sheet that, hang on, I can just stick on right here. Yes. Okay, so my guest today is Chris Burkett from TDK, and we're going to talk about Flex Shield noise suppression sheets, which, believe me, can be real lifesavers if your design heads to manufacturing with EMI uh, challenges. All right, let's get going. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about Flex Shield from TDK. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. So we're talking about Flex Shield today, but Chris, I'm not exactly sure what Flex Shield is. Flex Shields are thin magnetic sheets that are used for various applications in, in the electronics world. They come in different types of materials depending on what the application is. So these can be what we call low loss or high loss. They are available in numerous thicknesses. And as I will show you later, the thickness has a big impact on performance, both in suppressing unwanted EMI noise or improving, for example, NFC signals for communication. They also are available in what we call a hybrid material. That's gonna be a magnetic sheet layer plus a, a metal layer. And that metal layer improves the attenuation somewhat at the lower frequencies, but when you get into the higher frequencies, it is the dominant factor in, in attenuating unwanted EMI noise. It comes with both conductive and non-conductive top surfaces. This is important when we talk later on about grounding the material. And it comes with double-sided adhesive, and we can put it on the top side or the bottom side, depending on how you're going to mount these magnetic materials. One of the things that we hear a lot about in the industry is, oh, these type of magnetic sheets for noise suppression are just Band-Aids. However, if the customer uses this in their product and they go through a FCC or other regulatory certification test and it passes with this magnetic sheets or flex shields on it, it is required to stay on the product until you do a redesign, retest, and then get compliance with it not being there. So it's not really a Band-Aid. Actually, it ends up being many times as part of the end product. In the world of where we want to try to improve the signals rather than attenuate them, it has a big impact on the performance of the antennas used in RFID and NFC systems and applications. Cool. I can definitely see that. Now, Chris, what kind of use cases would be best for these flex shields? It depends on the end application and what you're trying to do with them. If you're trying to suppress unwanted EMI noise, there's two areas that you need to look at. The first being emissions, meaning that's noise that you are creating that could be projected out to the rest of the world. There are regulatory requirements and standards that dictate how much noise and the level of that noise you can put out to the rest of the world. The other side is susceptibility. That is the rest of the world generating noise and you're trying to protect you and your product from it coming in and having adverse effects on your product and its performance. In the case of NFC and RFID applications, there's cases where you have metal behind it and no metal behind it. In the case that there are metal services, you wanna make sure that the magnetic field pattern that's generated by the antenna does not go into that metal and adversely affect the performance of the NFC or RFID antenna. If there is no metal, the, the antenna pattern without a magnetic sheet there will generate an omnidirectional pattern. So it would be 360 degrees. And if you have a RFID reader, or NFC device on your desk, it will generate some of that signal into the desk and just be wasted energy. So if you place a flex shield type material, it provides directionality and improves performance of the reader itself. In applications where we're working with wireless power, if it's magnetic induction, meaning you're tightly coupled, the magnetic sheet or the shield will help with the coupling factor and provide better transfer of energy through the air. In the case of magnetic resonance, the higher the Q, the better performing the longer range type 
wireless transfer is. So the magnetic material, the flex shield, then determines the quality factor of the whole system. And then you run into other applications where you want to contain some magnetic flux, maybe keep it away from a metal surface, but you don't want to absorb too much of it because you're going to be taken away from the desired magnetic signal that might be coming off a power supply or whatever. And, and so you just want to make sure that you contain it, but you're not attenuating it and impacting the signal that you want too much. And then lastly, they do provide ESD barrier, electrostatic discharge barrier, and provide some safety in terms of that. Okay, cool. So Chris, you talked earlier about high loss and low loss materials. Can you tell us more about what these flex shields are made up of? Yes. So as I mentioned earlier, they come in various materials and configurations. So for TDK, our flex material, we have multiple base materials. We have ferrite based, and there's multiple materials that fall into that ferrite base family. So they all have a slightly different material composition depending on what we're trying to do, whether we're trying to get higher permeability or we're trying to get higher losses in the material, whether we need to be working in an environment with higher temperatures. So even though they're all ferrite based, the composition allows a little bit different performance, as I said, depending on the application. Then we have permalloy materials, or also called nickel iron. And these provide and applications where thinness is of utmost importance. So you're able to provide a little bit more containment in ultra-thin magnetic sheets based upon its higher permeability, which again, I will discuss here in a little bit. We have low loss materials. Those are used for NFC and RFID applications. And then we have high loss applications where you're trying to suppress unwanted EMI noise signals and energy. Talked a little bit about high permeability and low permeability. I will show you in a couple slides the importance of the permeability of the material, but simply put, the permeability in an RF, ID, and NFC application will dictate the Q value of the material, and higher Q being better. So in the case of EMI applications, the higher permeability will allow you to contain more of the magnetic flux in it before it allows it to escape out to the areas that you're trying to protect. Then there's various sheet stack ups. So we have the ferrite-based materials that are only a magnetic sheet, so only the ferrite. Then we have the magnetic sheets plus a metal layer, either aluminum or copper. The permalloy material that we have coming out soon is only with a copper layer. And then we have a family that we take a centered ferrite thin sheet, and it's cracked and then broken up into small particles, and then it's put inside of a resin. And this allows us to get a higher permeability properties for high Q type materials but it's a, it's a little bit more problematic in its system and it, we can only go down to 100 microns thickness, whereas some of these other materials were down into the six micron range. We also have a stack up that says we can have a conductive layer on the top side, which then helps with grounding and shielding. And then we also have insulated top side. So in the case where you put this on top of components, you don't wanna create an electrical short across those components. Again, depends on the application what type of stack up that you would need. And then, as I said, we provide double-sided adhesive on the bottom side, top side, or even both, if that's what you need. In terms of thicknesses, we have a new material coming out that's 16 microns thick, and that includes 10 microns just for the adhesive. All the way up to 200 microns. So again, depends on your application, how much shielding you need or how much EMI suppression you need. The thickness has a big impact on performance. And lastly, we run into applications where high temp is required. So we have materials now that go up to 125 C, and these are targeting both automotive and industrial type of applications. Okay, cool. So Chris, what does TDK offer in the realm of flex shields? So in our product lineup, we have multiple materials, as I said, that fall under the ferrite group. So in looking at this slide, the IFL 10M on the left side, the IF 12 on the left side, and we call that higher permeability. And then the IFL-16, we call super high permeability. As you look at these three materials, the mu prime is increasing as you go down. So the IFL-10M is at 120 at one megahertz. The IFL-12 is 180. And the IFL-16 is 220 at one megahertz. Over on the right side, we have what we call our hybrid type materials. And these are a magnetic layer plus metal. And the two materials that fall into this grouping are the IFM-16 and the IFM-10M. And the IFM-16 comes with an aluminum shield and the IF-10M comes with an internal copper shield. Then also on the right side is the IFF-08 material 
This is a high temperature resistance type, and this is for the high temperature applications, as I mentioned earlier, the 125 degrees C for industrial and automotive applications. And then finally, the IFL04, which is on the bottom right, it's for NFC and RFID applications, high mu prime, low mu double prime, so high Q, and again, targeting applications that you're trying to improve the range and performance of, of antenna associated with these NFC and RFID systems. Okay, Chris, so is there a way to tell which flex shield has which material associated with it? Yes. So when we look at our part number descriptions, we kind of describe the part that's construction in the part number itself. So looking at the top tables, we have a series, which is the product group. So in this case, it gives an example of IFL, which is standard material. The IFM is a hybrid material, so it comes with copper or aluminum. The IFF then, as I mentioned earlier, is the high temperature material. And then we have an IPM family, which is brand new and will be released early next year. Next table is the material type. So there's various material constructions and compositions. So this will tell you which of the material families that we're using in this specific flex shield, polymer base, high Q, low loss, and so forth. So there's different material performances based upon the material type. The next one after the dash is the magnetic material thickness only. This is not the total thickness. If you look at the picture on the bottom right, it will show that there's more than just a magnetic sheet there, but this gives you the thickness of the magnetic material. The next column, an example shows an N, is the surface film. And this is a protective film that's an option to come with it. So it's either none or various thicknesses that are listed there. Next is the type of adhesive tape that's used. So it can come with no adhesive tape. It can come with different thicknesses. And again, as I mentioned, it can come on the top side, bottom side, or both sides. And then finally, we get into the physical dimensions of the sheets or, or rolls. So the first one there, in this case, 300, that tells you the length. So in the case that it's a sheet, it comes in 300 millimeters length. And if it's a roll, it comes to 100 meters for most material. But once we get to 0.2 millimeters thickness, it drops down in some cases to 50 meters max distance. And then finally is the width of the sheet or roll. So it will either be 200 millimeters wide or 300 millimeters wide. And an example of the sheet and rolls are shown down at the bottom. So, Chris, is there a general description of the material needed here and so people can take a quick look? Yes. The IFL 10, M, 12, and 16 materials, those are what we call general high loss magnetic shields. And estimated range is basically one megahertz up to about three gigahertz range. The IFF 08 is, as I explained before, designated as our high temp material. And again, it's 125C. It ranges for its effectiveness between 10 megahertz and up to three gigahertz. Then we get into the hybrid materials, again, either magnetics plus copper or magnetics plus aluminum. They start in the 500 kilohertz range and go all the way up to one gigahertz. And finally, some new materials that we're getting ready to introduce, the IPM01, which is the hybrid permalloy material, so nickel ferrite plus a copper layer, ultra thin, 16 microns, including the adhesive, and it ranges from about 100 kilohertz all the way up to one gigahertz. We will probably introduce this material, though, in a slightly thicker version. We have customers that said it's thin enough. Now we want to improve performance. So we're targeting releasing a 21 micron version first and then coming out with the 6 micron or 16 microns plus adhesive material later in 2021. For applications for low loss materials for NFC, RFID, and, and wireless power, the IFL04 is our generic high Q, good performance type material, but we've got applications now where they're trying to get a little bit extended range in their RFID reader or their NFC card. So we've come up with a higher permeability material and it's designated as IFL 05K. Like the IPM 01, it will be released very soon. In fact, this is getting ready to go into the distribution area here in the next couple months. Then we have the IBF 15 centered material, as I explained earlier. It is a much higher mu prime material, but also thicker. So depending on the application, whether you can tolerate a thicker material up to 100 microns or more will dictate whether you can use this higher Q material in your application. Okay, so Chris, I think I'm understanding a bit more about flex shields, but can you explain a bit how they actually work? Yes. 
So there's two equations that I want to bring up just to kind of help everyone understand what's going on and what's important. So there's a equation called the complex permeability. So mu equals mu prime minus J mu double prime. So mu prime is the permeability of the material. Mu double prime relates to the material's losses. Okay, so those two work hand in hand to determine whether it's better for EMI applications or better for NFC RFID applications. Another one is what we call a figure of merit, and it's T times mu prime. T means thickness. And the higher that figure of merit, the better performing the material is. So why wouldn't people always use the max thickness that's possible? A lot of times there's mechanical limitations. And then there's a cost factor that comes in. So the thicker you are, the more magnetic material that's there, and it costs a little bit more. But in EMI suppression applications, mu prime, the higher that is, the better it is in shielding. And the performance will allow more of the magnetic field or the magnetic flux to be contained within the material. So it provides better containment of the undesired noise energy. Higher mu double prime allows for that energy or that magnetic field that's going through the material to be attenuated, creating higher losses. So you get better attenuation. And actually, as the noise energy gets attenuated, it causes heat. So you're actually removing the noise energy from the system in terms of heat. Thickness, again, will have a big impact, and it just has more magnetic mass there that you can contain more flux. So you can have a stronger EMI signal, and the thicker the material will enable better absorbing of more of that unwanted magnetic flux, and then to attenuate it or just contain it and remove it from the system. Adding a metal layer also yields better noise protection, and it does this through reflection. A metal alone will allow some reduction of EMI through eddy current losses, which will generate heat, but it doesn't remove all the noise energy from the system. Later in a slide, I will talk about EMI cans that RF systems use a lot, and it's just an aluminum can that blocks internal noise from going out and outside noise from coming in, but it doesn't remove it from the system, and that can be problematic. But adding metal to our flex shield materials does provide more noise suppression, especially when we get into the gigahertz range. And then a conductive top layer in that variable stack up that I've talked about, if you have a conductive top layer, it allows for electrical grounding. And what that does is it reduces the parasitics of the solution and reduces the L's and C's, the inductance and the capacitance. And this again is good for higher frequency performance. When we get over to the NFC and RFID applications and even wireless power, the higher mu allows for higher inductance, which means less turns are needed, which means lower resistance and also keeps more flux within the material. And this increases the efficiency and increases the Q and so forth. Lower mu double prime reduces the core losses. So in the case of high Q materials, it will help improve Q, thus giving better antenna performance. Then we get into the thickness of the material. The thicker the material, the better it is in containing magnetic flux. In the case of RFID applications, NFC applications, or wireless power, you do want to contain more of the flux to keep it away from any metal or any kind of any current losses that would be created on the backside and thus increase in performance and improve in the overall Q of the antenna. To further emphasize the points made on the previous slide, the curves on the left are what we call our general materials. So this goes back to the IFL 10M the IFL-12 and IFL-16. The solid lines there in red, blue, and green are the mu prime or the permeabilities of the materials. And the dashed lines are the associated mu double prime. As you can see for all of the materials in the range of about one megahertz to let's call it two megahertz, these are very high Q materials. Even though they're for EMI noise suppression, the mu double prime near one megahertz is, is nothing. So there are applications where we have used these noise suppression sheets in applications less than one megahertz for higher Q properties. But as you continue to go higher in frequency, there comes a point where your permeability starts to drop down and you have a sudden rise in the mu double prime. And this is the area that you want to use these materials in for EMI noise suppression. And then as you continue further out and you get into the gigahertz range, the permeability properties of the materials have been suppressed. And now, as I mentioned earlier, that the mu double prime comes in and it's basically the only thing providing the EMI noise suppression in terms of heat generation and losses within the material. And that's why a lot of people would like to use the hybrid type materials where you have a little bit more attenuation provided by the metal at the higher frequency. Mu prime drops 
there's less containment capability of the material. As mu double prime increases, you get more attenuation within the material itself. Over on the right side are the RFID NFC type applications where, where high Q is desired. So high Q and low loss. The materials listed there are the IFL 05K. U prime is in the blue and the IFL 04 U prime is in the red. And down at the bottom, the dash blue line is the mu double prime of IFL 05K and the red dash is the mu double prime of IFL 04 materials. As you can see, these are targeting 13.56 megahertz applications for NFC and RFID and both have very high Q in that 13.56 megahertz range. Moving on to the impact of only mu prime in terms of attenuation over frequency. Now we're comparing IFL 10M to IFL 12. So the 10M is on the left, the 12 is on the right. If you look at the red curves, both of these materials are at 200 microns thick. And at 10 megahertz, the IFL 10M is providing just over 15 dB of attenuation, while the similar thickness IFL 12 is closer to 20. And again, the higher mu prime allows the material to contain more of the undesired magnetic flux and shielding it away from the objects or the product or the circuits that you're trying to protect from. So continuing with these curves, now if you look at all four colored curves, so on the left with the IFL 10M, the dash 200, dash 100, dash 050, and dash 025, these are the designations for the thickness. So dash 025 is 25 microns thick, dash 050 is 50 microns thick, dash 100 is 100 microns thick, and dash 200 is 200 microns thick. As you look at the IFL 10M on the left, as you go thinner, the attenuation at the same frequency goes down. And this is the importance of always trying to be as thick as possible for both type of applications, for EMI noise suppression and for high Q NFC RFID type applications. So if you look over to the right side, even though it's higher mu prime to start, it falls down in terms of attenuation as you get thinner and thinner, just like the IFL 10M on the left. So then I mentioned the impact of grounding and getting rid of those parasitic inductances and capacitances. This slide shows the ultra thin six micron IPM01 without adhesive, with and without grounding. So the original signal, just by adding the IPM01, was suppressed about 10 dB. Now you can ground that top layer and get further improvement on EMI noise suppression. So if you look in the, the 60 to 70 megahertz range, just by grounding the top surface, we're able to achieve another 7 dB of attenuation and further suppress the measured microvolts that is attributed to the EMI noise level in that area and on that circuit. This was actually performed on a handset phone, and it was measured on the flex printed circuit between the circuit board and the display. Okay, great. Now, Chris, I think I'm getting a handle on these flex shields, but what about applications? Where do you see these flex shields being designed into? Every day I get new requests and new and unique applications, and it's, it's kind of interesting that people find great applications to use these materials in. So standard type of products, though, would be NFC and RFID readers, writers, smart cards. There's now these metal smart cards that are out in the market. And due to the metal body, they have to have a shield to create that directionality that I explained earlier and project the magnetic field in the direction that you need it to be to improve performance. We've got applications that we're on now that are keyless car entries that you come up with either your key fob with NFC in it, or there's a card that you have that you can enter without having a physical key. RFID readers and RFID tags. Again, the performance is improved if you put a magnetic sheet behind it. And then these payment systems that are very popular over in Europe and, and over in Asia. In Japan, one of the most popular cards for taxis and for trains are what they call the SWICA card. And you have to put them into the machine and it reads it one way. So there is a magnetic sheet that can be in there to help provide better performance and read it from a further distance. In the terms of EMI suppression, the role of the metal cans that are used in a lot of these RF circuits is to keep what's inside in terms of noise in and keep what's outside out. But the noise that's generated inside is going to be bouncing around off the metal and you're not really going to attenuate all of it. So that noise then is free to bounce around and get onto other circuits and cause more problems than it's actually solving. By adding a magnetic layer there, which will turn that energy 
into heat and remove it from the, the system, the noise energy actually has a double path through the magnetic material. It's got the incident energy wave that goes through the material to the metal can, bounces off that reflected, and comes back through the material again. So you get a doubling effect on it and you get better attenuation. And again, it's actually moving a lot of that noise energy from the system and protecting your internal device and from self-inflicting more, more harm than you are doing good. So in applications that have extended length flex printed circuits, we all know that the long metal lengths can be a antenna and pick up undesired EMI noise or actually be an antenna to broadcast unwanted EMI noise. So what is done, flex shield is then sandwiching the flex printed circuit, creating a inductance, which then will suppress the EMI noise and prevent it from continuing down the length of the flex print circuit. Okay, so Chris, are there any other applications that this type of technology would be good for? There are applications, especially in the wireless power world, where making use of the ultra thinness of the flex shields is a benefit to the end user. These applications tend to be in the wearable market. Let's talk hearing aids where thinness is of utmost importance. So we have applications where we're using the high loss materials in the high Q range or low loss range at two megahertz and less. So we're enabled to use these ultra thin sheets, put on an ultra thin coil and provide RX coil solutions, the receive side solutions that are in the 100 micron type range and enable the customer to put them into other areas that they've never been able to do before. Okay, Chris, so is there a way to tell which flex shield is right for my next design? I wish it was that easy. Every application seems to be rather unique. But there are some paths that the user can take to identify the right starting point. The first thing that the user has to do is identify where his EMI noise. And this will determine what is the best material to use and what approach. Are you going to be looking at containment? Are you going to look at absorption, attenuation? Or are you going to look at reflecting it? The next thing that user needs to look at is what is the existing noise level? That's going to dictate what material is, is going to be used, but it's also going to dictate what thickness is going to be required. As I showed earlier in the attenuation curves, the thicker the material, the higher the attenuation. The next area that needs to be considered is whether you're emitting or radiating noise or you're trying to protect from susceptibility of noise coming from the outside world to you. So you need to know what the acceptable EMC noise level is and what the profile requirements are for that. And each industry has their own unique noise level versus frequency profile that needs to be met. You have to determine what is acceptable or permissible for your application. So this is gonna determine what material needs to be used, what the stack up is, and again, what the thickness is. The next area that needs to be understood is what the approach is for compliance. Again, is containing it okay? So do you need a higher mu material? Is attenuation more important? Do you need to remove it from the system so high mu double prime? Or can you just simply reflect it to the outside world in the case of an RF can that you don't care? It wasn't your problem to begin with, so you can just reflect it back and let it be someone else's issue. All you're trying to do is protect the signals and the components that are underneath the can. Or it can be a combination of all of these. But these will all determine what material needs to be used, what thickness, and what the stack up is. Then we get into some issues that are out of our control and end up being an issue on the customer side. And that's the mechanical limitations for the solution. This will dictate actually how thick the flex shield can be and what surface resistance that we're allowed to have. Again, we have families that have either a conductive top surface or a non-conductive top surface. If there was no space left between the top of the components and the metal can, you can't put too thick of a flex shield there, nor can you put a conductive top surface because if they got in contact with two different components, it could actually cause an electrical short and cause failure of the system. We also need to look at what the EMI source is, and that will determine where and how we're going to apply the magnetic sheet flex shield type solution. So once you have all those identified, the user needs to go back and look at the material data curves and find out what is providing the right attenuation in the right frequency ranges. And once you've chosen the material and you go out and do some testing, and if it meets the requirements of the regulatory standard or FCC, you can continue on. If not, then you go back and adjust the material or adjust the thickness until you achieve the desired results. On the RFID and NFC applications, key is the operating frequency. You're trying to optimize the frequency that the operation is being done at. So in the case of RFID and NFC, the majority of the time that's at 13.56 megahertz. So you're trying to get the highest permeability and the lowest losses at 13.56. 
you need to identify the targeted communication range. This is going to determine the material. The higher the permeability, go back to that mu prime times T figure of merit, the higher the permeability, the better off the signal range is. Next, we need to identify whether there's metal right behind the shield. This is going to determine how thick we need to have the material. You want to make sure that no flux, magnetic flux, escapes out the back, gets into that metal, causes eddy current losses, and it reduces the efficiency and the range of your antenna. So there needs to be an understanding of how far behind the magnetic shield is any metal objects. And then we go back to the mechanical issues again. Are there limitations on the height? Again, this could have an impact on performance and what material we recommend. In the area of wireless power, are you doing magnetic induction, which is typically under one megahertz? Are you doing magnetic resonance that can be anywhere from 100 kilohertz all the way up to 6.78 megahertz in many cases? So we need to understand what the operating frequency is and then choose a material that optimizes for those frequencies. Is the key point magnetic coupling, which is the case of magnetic induction type wireless power? If that's the case, we need to improve the coupling factor K, which means that we need to have a much higher mu prime value, higher permeability. If there's an efficiency or thermal requirement, now we need to look at the mu double prime. We need to make sure that we're not causing efficiency losses by attenuating that magnetic flux within the material or causing losses that generate heat within the material itself. And then in the case of magnetic resonance applications, is there a minimum quality factor Q that we need to target? And this is going to be determined both by the mu prime and mu double prime values of the magnetic shield. And then we get into the mechanical limitations again. If there's a limit on how thick the shield can be, that is going to have an impact on performance and again may allow some of the magnetic flux generated by the AC going through the coil to come out the back and get into other objects and cause heating and any current losses. And then finally, this is more unique to wireless power, the coil power that's going through the coil itself. Basically, it's the current. And the current can create magnetic flux density saturation issues. So we have to make sure that we have enough magnetic mass, so thickness, to be able to hold and contain all the magnetic flux with the higher current going through the coil itself. So that's going to have a big impact on what the thickness requirement of the material is. All right. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Chris. Thank you, Amelia. Pleasure talking with you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from TDK. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.